We have a very special speaker with us, Brendan Rocky, who has come um, from the Alamosa area, Monta Vista, Alamosa area. He's in very high demand because he is such a successful producer. We have wanted him to come here before and are very happy that he's made it on this occasion. Brendan, someone told me that you grew like 70 varieties of potatoes. Just 30, okay. I'm just gonna hand the mic over to him because this guy knows what he's doing. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, I guess for those of you I can't deliver seed to this morning, uh, just a little background on Rocky Farms. Uh, we farm just north of center in the San Luis Valley. We grow both fresh market and certified seed potatoes. Um, we grow anything but russet potatoes. So kind of gives you an idea of where we're coming from with a lot of this talk is just we've never been one to really go with the crowd. We always have stood out in the crowd a little bit. Not afraid to try some things that are a little bit different. Um, so, like I mentioned, we grow about 30 different varieties and uh, we do a tier rotation. So what I'm going to be talking about today is holistic potato management. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today and a lot about what Mike and Vic have been talking about is just really changing our perceptions of what's going on. There's nothing that crazy about what we're doing when we really stop and think about it. It kind of reminded me of a, a story this morning. Uh, I had a good friend that had two boys. And when she brought the second boy home from the hospital one morning, she was breastfeeding, and the second brother got up and he saw her doing that. He was a little over two years old. He said, Mom, what you doing? He said, I'm giving your, she said, I'm giving your little brother some breakfast. And he looked at her and said, you got pancakes in there? <laughs> so it's just all a matter of how you want to look at this. <laughs> so, like I said, the title of the talk is Holistic Potato Management. And a year ago, if you had asked if we, were, if, I, if we were holistic in our farmer, I'd probably told you, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. But I had a good conversation with Ray Archuleta. Uh, Mike's mentioned his name a few times today. And he, and he was going on a tour of our farm. He said, wow, you guys are really holistic. I said, ah, hold on there. He said, well, do you really understand what the word holistic means? And I couldn't define it. So what he did is he told me his definition of holistic. And after hearing his definition, I started to think about it and realized we are holistic. Because what we do is we tend to look at the big picture. We don't try to dissect things into separate components because everything is interrelated. Everything has an impact on something else. So there's the actual definition of holistic. And once you start looking at that in a different, from a different perspective, you start to realize that's really what we are doing. So what he suggested, he thought, you know, if we change the spelling of it, he thought people would have a better understanding of what that word meant. He, he thought we should spell it holistic, because that's really what it's about, looking at the whole picture. Now, this talk was originally designed for uh, potato growers in the San Luis Valley. So it's really focused around the potato crop. So keep that in mind, but just because you don't grow potatoes doesn't mean you don't won't get some information out of this, because soil health is universal. There are separate issues that we deal with, specifically with potatoes. But with what I'm, the diagram I'm going to use up here, you could really insert any crop in there and adapt it to your own situation. So in the San Luis Valley, when we're growing this potato crop, there's certain issues that we deal with that have an impact on the crop. And they are insect pressure, foliar disease, water, weeds, uh, pathogenic nematodes, fertility, soil-borne pathogens. These are the real big issues. And the biggest thing I see the difference between us and what conventional agriculture does is conventional agriculture tends to deal with everything very linear. And I agree with them. All these issues surrounding the potato crop have a direct impact on that crop. But the way conventional agriculture deals with these problems is they just look at the problem individually. So what they do is they go out and they'll take one of those problems and they solve that problem by itself. So if you'll take insects, for example, aphid pressure is a big deal with growing potatoes. So what do they do? Aphid can cause a problem in the potato crop, so they go out and try to remove the aphid from the system. It's very linear, but what they don't do is look at how all these other issues interrelate to each other. And the biggest problem with this picture here is it's missing some pieces. What we need to do is start looking at these other components and looking at the interrelationship between all these components to really start understanding the big picture. So what these issues around us and how conventional agriculture deals with them really doesn't deal with the beneficial biology that grows on both on the plant and in the soil, 
the soil structure, carbon, and predatory insects. And one thing I like to do is, you, another way of looking at it, is you can kind of compare it to the human body. All these different components in agriculture work together, much like all the different organs in the human body. And I think everybody in here would agree, if you do damage to your kidneys, it's going to have effects on other parts of your body, and so on. So just like conventional agriculture, when we tend to have a problem with our bodies, how do we solve the problem? We just look at the problem itself, and we have a very linear approach to it. So if you have an ear infection caused by bacteria or something going on in your your approach is not to kill the bacteria. So you might take a drug such as amoxicillin. And I'm not going to disagree that amoxicillin doesn't do a great job of killing that bacteria that's causing the issue, but what other problems might you be creating by taking this drug? Now if you go online and look this up, these are the side effects that are associated with amoxicillin. Have you guys ever looked at the bottle, the, the side effects that are that you, potential with taking this drug? I was kind of surprised by some of these. I mean, some of these we all kind of know, like the diarrhea, some of them, I think those are some common ones, but there's some pretty serious stuff up there. And if this is going to be our approach to solving these, these ear infections, I think we need to really weigh out what are the potential problems we might be causing by taking this simple approach to controlling the problem. So when you go back to this diagram, I'm going to kind of go through the steps with conventional agriculture, the, the very simple approaches we're taking to controlling these problems and what other impacts we might be having out there. So like I mentioned earlier, leaf and the, and the potato crop is a very big problem if, if you let the, the population get out of balance. So what do we do? We go out and try to kill the aphid. That's our, our number one focus. But the trouble with that is, is not only are you killing the aphid out there, but you're also killing the predatory insects out there. And, and the, when I start talking to potato growers in the valley about this, they look at you like you're kind of crazy, but I actually feel like we need a certain population of aphid in our field to keep everything in balance. By completely wiping out any one living component, you're setting yourself up for an epidemic. Because you have a lot of beneficial insects that are in the field controlling these aphid for you, but the trouble is the predators, such as the ladybugs that are feeding off this aphid, what happens when you remove their food source? They have nothing to live off of. Their populations drop off. So now all of a sudden you're setting yourself up for an epidemic. It's almost like creating an addiction. So by using that insecticide that first time, you're creating a situation. Now you have no other choice but to continually follow up with the insecticide because you've wiped the slate clean and you've opened up this door for an epidemic to come in and wipe you out. Now the other thing I think hardly anybody thinks about when you're looking at insecticides is the, its impact on the beneficial life of the soil. Because you always think about an insecticide, it's being applied foliar, you're attacking the aphid. But when you think about insecticides, is they are designed to disrupt the nervous system of a living organism. And there are so many living organisms in the soil that are being impacted by these insecticides as well. Um, Jill Papert is one that really made me realize this because I never really thought about the impact of it. But she said uh, out of all the sides, she feels that insecticides are the most damaging to the life, the living components in the soil. So now the next one, next real big issue in the valley is your, your pathogens, both foliar and soil borne. And we have much the, the same approach to controlling them as we did the insecticides. We just focus on the fungi that's causing the problem. That's it. So what do we do? We go out and we apply a fungicide to kill, kill that pathogen. But once again, what other impacts are we having on the system as a whole when we're trying to go out and use this simple approach to controlling our issues? These fungicides that are out being applied to control the pathogens in the soil are also killing a lot of the beneficial fungi that's living out there. Um, Mike and Dick will talk about this quite a bit, about the, the fungi in the soil that are promoting all these benefits for us. And when we're out there trying to kill off all these problems, we're damaging them as well. Um, there's also a lot of fungi that grows right on the foliage itself that we don't give enough credit to. So once again, we're going out and trying to control that disease, but we're, we're wiping the slate clean and setting ourselves up for an epidemic.
So what I was showing on this one, so the fungicides are going in and killing the beneficial fungi, but what we need to realize is the beneficial fungi that we're killing off is actually what was keeping everything in check and controlling the disease for us to begin with. So anytime we have to go in there and apply something with side on it that's killing off a component of the soil, we need to keep in mind what other impacts is we're having there. And another really good example of this is nematodes. Nematodes can cause a lot of damage in, in a potato crop. Um, they actually lay their eggs in the tubers, the eggs hatch, and it causes physical damage to, to the potato itself. And what we're starting to find in the valley is operations that are using heavy fungicide applications are all of a sudden having a large rise in nematode populations. Now why would that be? These are two completely unrelated items. But I have a pretty good idea of what's going on in there. There's actually fungi that live in the soil that keep these parasitic nematodes in check for us. What you see here up on the top is you have these loops out there and they've got a sensor on them. And when that nematode swims through that loop, it triggers it and it clamps, clamps down on the nematode. So what you see in these bottom pictures is one uh, where the rings have already been triggered and they've already they've actually grasped onto that nematode. The hyphae will actually enter the nematode and it'll start living off of the nematode itself. So when we're out there applying these fungicides, trying to control the fungal problems on our plant and in the soil, we're killing off all this beneficial fungi in the soil as well and it's creating this opportunity for the nematodes to overwhelm the system once again. So now we've reached the point where we're starting to have nematode problems. So now what you're starting to see in the valley is large applications of nematicide. So now we're going out and trying to apply nematicide to kill off these large nematode populations that are doing damage to the potatoes. But the trouble with that is there are also beneficial nematodes in the soil. So here, once again, we have our, our bad guy, our target, where all of our focus is, we're applying this chemical, trying to kill it off, but we're doing damage to the system as, uh, as a whole. And the nematodes are so important for nutrient cycling. There's so much more they do. The nematodes even actually control other pests for us. Here's a really good example of this. What you got on, on the left slide up here is you had, a, I believe it was a golf course in California where they were having a lot of trouble with white grubs out there. And you see the damage it was doing out there. So what they did, instead of going out and trying to kill the white grubs off with some chemical, they actually inoculated the field with beneficial nematodes. And the nematodes were able to go out there, and you see the two white grubs on the bottom there, you have a healthy living one on the left, and on the right you have one that has actually been attacked by a nematode. And what that does, the nematode actually goes in there and kills off that white grub for you. So instead of going out and trying to kill off a component of it, you actually can go out there and apply another living organism to get everything back in balance to help control your problems for you. Now fertility is another big issue. Um, I think we can all agree that we need proper fertility to grow a crop. And I'm, I'm not disputing that point. But the problem that comes along with inorganic fertilizers, which is why specifically labeled it, is not the fertility it provides, but these inorganic fertilizers are very high in salt. So once again, we're overwhelming our system with an ingredient that does not promote the life. Once again, we're killing off the life. We're applying these inorganic fertilizers in such large quantities that it's creating an environment where the beneficial biology cannot thrive in the soil anymore. So here we are, we're, our only focus was fertility, so we're putting out the inorganic fertilizer trying to solve that problem. But what other problems are we, we creating by doing that? Now I've got a lot of arrows here pointing to the beneficial soil biology, and we haven't really talked about carbon and soil structure yet. And to me, soil structure I think is one of the most underrated components of this system as a whole. What happens when you have healthy, living biology in the soil, and what I mean by that is bacteria, the fungi, the earthworms, all these living components, is they actually help um, provide the soil with the structure that it needs. And this really goes back to what we saw this morning with the slate test. What happens is the bacteria can take these small soil particles and doing their business in the soil, they're actually producing polysaccharides, that, which glue these small particles together, forming microaggregates. Then once you create that environment, the fungi start thriving, 
they start coming in through their high vein, the glomulin, they're actually taking these microaggregates, gluing them together and forming macroaggregates. So this is where your soil structure is coming from. And by having those aggregates out there, you're actually creating more pore space out in the soil, which allows for gas exchange, and it's also increasing your infiltration rate and your water holding capacity. And then the beneficial biology is also very important for the carbon in the soil. Without the biology in the soil, when you added carbon to the soil, it would never become, it would never decompose, it would never break down. So the biology is our best friend there as far as taking these residues and incorporating them, breaking them down, adding them into the soil. Now the carbon works hand in hand with these aggregates too, as far as forming the soil structure. But having that carbon, the organic matter there, and that's why once again to the slate test, the, the aggregates that are holding together better have a higher organic matter, that carbon is very important to it, forming these, these structures, these aggregates and holding everything together. So now the carbon and the soil structure have a huge, play a huge role as far as water goes. Um, we all agree that the crop needs water to thrive, but when you don't have that soil structure out there, you have a lot of compaction, you have very little pore space, so you're more prone to run off so you're not getting the water into the soil where the roots are where you need the water. And then the carbon really plays a big role there too because they'll show a huge impact there as far as, as the organic matter rises, your water holding capacity becomes dramatically better too. So now we have this poor soil structure out here. So when we irrigate, we're completely waterlogging the soil. We don't have any pockets of air in the soil. So what does this does? It creates a, a great environment for disease to start overrunning this. When you have that waterlogged soil, you're more prone to soil-borne pathogens. Um, it's affecting how you're irrigating, so it gives you more potential for problems as far as foliar disease goes. And then these, these compact waterlogged soils are also creating an ideal environment for weeds to thrive. Um, I don't... I don't know how much irrigation you guys have in this area, but see, that's where we're really fortunate in San Luis Valley is we're 100% under center of pivot irrigation. So a lot of people, you start talking about carbon and soil structure, how important that is, they think, ah, it's no big deal. I'll just run my sprinklers differently to compensate for that. But the thing to keep in mind is when you have that structure and the carbon out there, it makes it so much easier to run your sprinklers. You're actually allowed to run your sprinklers more properly so that's why I have the two different arrows up there on irrigation. So what happens if you're doing proper irrigation, I think you can help mitigate the problems to a certain degree, but if you're out there running the sprinklers poorly, you actually make these problems even worse. So there's a lot of waste out there just due to poor management of the sprinklers. <clears throat> so once again, we have all these other issues that came through here, and it created a weed population how are we going to go out and control the weed population? Once again, we're going to use a side, a herbicide. We're going to remove something from the system once again because we have this unwanted crop out there. Now, when I was putting this whole program together, I mean, it was really easy for me to look at, you know, fungicide, what other impacts is it going to have moving down the line, and insecticides, that was a really easy one. Herbicide, I really struggled with at first because it's out there controlling the weeds, but I wasn't sure what other impacts that herbicide might be having on the system as a whole. But as I started doing some research and talking to some guys, they're starting to have huge issues out in the Midwest where they have a lot of these Roundup Ready crops. They're finding out that these crops that they're applying heavy, heavy amounts of glyphosate to are becoming very susceptible and very prone to fusarium. They're seeing a huge correlation there. Much like we're seeing with the fungicide in the nematode population. So once again, I think we need to start going back and looking at the system as a whole. Because here they have this great crop out there, it's easy to control the weeds, but they're causing other issues by taking this simple approach to it. So another way to control the weeds, if you don't want to use the herbicide, is through tillage. But there are some other problems that come along with excessive tillage as well. First of all, and this, this is just going to be a, kind of a repeat of what Mike was talking about, but when you Till the soil, you open up that soil, you get a flush of oxygen into this soil. You get a peak in the biological activity, they start going crazy. So what they end up doing is they actually end up digesting a lot of the organic matter that's in the soil. That's why tillage is so damaging to organic matter. So you get this flush of biology going crazy and they're, they're using up all the carbon and you're losing that from your soil structure. 
Tillage itself also does, it, does a physical disturbance of the soil structure. And when you have the structure out there, you have these glues holding everything together. When you're going through with an implement, it's actually taking those aggregates and physically destroying them, breaking them down into small, smaller particles, which is reducing your pore space. You have more trouble with water and gas exchange and more trouble with compaction. And then you're also <clears throat> doing a physical damage to the biology in the soil. And what that is, is you're just, you're just physically killing off the biology in the soil. And it's more damaging to the fungal component than it is the bacterial component. So these, the fungi in the soil that have been beneficial, they have these really long networks, these high main, very fragile, very easily to disturb. So you go through with a metal implement and you're doing a lot of damage. So what I thought was interesting is I created my own theoretical multi-side. This thing's going to kill everything for you. What I think is interesting is in the conventional agricultural industry is you don't mention side effects with these pesticides. You know, you might mention the, the damage it might do to the handlers or not, but what damage is this doing to the system as a whole? So I thought if we were going to be completely honest about it, if a product like this existed out there, and if we had to list side effects, I think they would look something like this. And what you'll notice is, as you start going through this, a lot of the side effects are the exact problems that we were trying to solve. And I've mentioned this to a lot of people in the San Luis Valley, and they really don't like this comment, but the issues we're dealing with in the San Luis Valley are all issues that we created ourselves by getting away from the functional system. So I don't think it would be fair to come in here and just tell you about all the things we're doing wrong, all the destruction we're doing, without telling you my opinion on how to solve this problem. Now once again, keep in mind, this is, this is a potato production in San Luis Valley. Take what pieces you can, apply it here. But it's not going to be a complete translation from one to the other. <clears throat> but what we feel is the foundation of our program at our farm are these two components right here green manure crops, and carbon-based fertilizers. This is, everything that we apply for fertility is carbon-based. And what I mean by that, it's not an inorganic fertilizer, it doesn't have the high salts, it's compost, it's fish, it has this carbon to come with it that actually feeds the biology of the soil for you. So, it's providing us with fertility, and it's also feeding the biology of the soil, like I mentioned. And then the green manure is doing two different things for us, too. Now, we, we had a little discussion with Dick earlier about, I don't think that the green manure itself is actually providing you with fertility. It's more about nutrient cycling. Now, legumes are a little different exception to that. You know, the legumes have the ability to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and add it to the soil. But as far as the other nutrients go, there's nothing in that green manure crop that didn't come from the soil to begin with. But I think in the valley, we have a huge misconception because we've had some guys that have tried Sudan grass for a green manure crop. They've pulled nutrient samples before the Sudan grass and then again after. And afterwards, they have an elevated level of nutrient in their samples. So they all think, great, this Sudan grass solved all my problems. It actually added nutrient to my soil. But what they're actually finding is the root system on the Sudan grass is so extensive, it's going well beneath the root zone that they're sampling, well beneath the root zone of the potato crop. And it's going down there and it's bringing up all these deep nutrients that have been leached through all the years past the root zone of the potato crop. So it brings these nutrients up, puts it into the foliage, and then when you shallow incorporate that nutrient, all you're doing is you're, you're cycling that nutrient. You're bringing the nutrient that's been lost and bringing it back up to where it's usable for the following potato crop. And then uh, it's also feeding the beneficial soil of biology, beneficial biology in the soil as well. And when I first started looking at green manure crops, I really thought the bulk of the benefit we were getting was from incorporating that residue, because that residue does a great job of feeding the biology as well. But I've started to change my mindset on that a little bit. I really think the bulk of the benefit we're getting from that is from that living root in the soil. And we all talk about adding, you know, raising organic matter by adding this residue, but I don't think we give that living root enough credit either. So when you have that living plant in the soil, it's taking CO2 from the atmosphere using the sunshine for energy. It's taking that carbon dioxide and incorporating it into the, into the plant. And the plant can actually send that carbon down through the roots and through exudates, it's releasing this, this carbon straight into the soil. And the reason it's doing that is it's feeding the biology in the soil. And what's really nice about the system once you get everything working too is 
the, the relationship between the root and the biology is really neat because the root can release exudates to feed the biology that it needs at a certain time. So the plant can actually dictate what nutrients become available at certain times. And I think that's really neat instead of going out there for us trying to outguess everything and knowing what to apply and what rates and what time. We just put these base products out there, the green manure and the carbon-based fertilizers, and we let the system take care of us. Now the next thing we do is proper irrigation. I, I manage my sprinklers very closely. I'm out in my fields every single day because I don't want to be doing damage to the system by overwatering or underwatering. And by having that proper irrigation, having the appropriate amount of water, what we're doing is creating an environment that's ideal for the biology and the soil to thrive. And that's exactly what we're after there. Um, talked about this one kind of a little bit already, you know, the carbon-based fertilizers adding carbon to the soil, and that's a pretty easy connection to make. Then the green manure adding the carbon to the soil as well. Now what's really neat, instead of having this little triangle here where everything's destroying itself, you actually, those three work so closely together that it's hard to just have one of those thriving without the other two. They really complement each other. So what happens is you have the biology that's now thriving in the soil, it's producing these microaggregates, and then the fungi comes in and produces this macroaggregate. And what this does is it actually pr promotes and provides a better environment for the biology to thrive in the soil. So you start changing this environment around to where the biology can thrive more, so now you have even more biology out there, which helps out the structure even more. So they, there's kind of a two-way street there. They're helping each other out at the same time. Um, the beneficial soil biology is digesting the carbon in the soil, the carbon is feeding the biology in the soil, and then the carbon is a very critical component to the soil structure, like I mentioned. So when I talk to a lot of guys and we start going over this concept, they, they, they want to know, well, how do I know if what I'm doing is working? How do I know if I'm headed in the right direction? We can see actual physical changes in our soil now as a result of this biology thriving in it. Uh, the picture you have up on the left here, it just we just have nice crumbly soil, but you can actually see how they aren't real tiny particles. They actually have those aggregates now, which are creating this proper environment for everything. We have tons of earthworms out in our soil, which are great. You know, Mike talked about that quite a bit as far as the pores out there, the nutrient cycling, everything in there. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on this bottom right picture, but what we've got going on there, there's a potato seed piece, and it, it's got brand new sprouts on there, and it's got some new roots in there. And the reason I like this picture is right around that root, you see a bunch of soil clustered around that root. And what's going on there is that root is releasing these exudates, feeding the biology right around that root system, and it's creating that sick, sticky substance, which is causing, causing the aggregation. You can see it right on the root. So I, I dug that piece up, and that root was just completely covered in, in the soil aggregates. Then up in the right, one thing that has really impressed me over the years is how our sprinkler tracks have changed. We're all on center pivot irrigation, and before we really started taking care of the soil, you know, we were doing the inorganic fertilizers and the chemicals like everybody else. We had sprinklers that we had to watch in certain spots of the fields every time they went around because we were burying those sprinklers. We were getting those things completely stuck out in the field because they were making such deep ruts. Once we started taking care of the soil, our ruts completely changed. We went from ruts that were 12 inches deep, and all of a sudden those, each year those ruts started coming up and up. And it, it's fascinating to me because at the same time, the tilth of our soil was becoming so much more fluffy, we didn't have the clods out there. And you would have thought it had been the exact opposite. You would have thought we'd have been burying that sprinkler even deeper. But by having that structure, those aggregates now, the, it, it has so much strength in there that it's actually able to support the weight of the sprinkler now. We, we no longer make ruts with our sprinkler. We're to the point now, when we plant our crop out there, we've got a really loose hill of potatoes out there. And we've got so much strength from that structure now that we don't even crush down that loose hill. We've got our sprinkler tracks climbing over every single hill throughout the duration of the season. When you can go, that's how you can just drive around and pick out some of the, the guys that aren't taking care of the soil because they've got ruts 12 inches deep. And those cause havoc at harvest time as well. So once again, um, just talking about the relationship between soil structure and the water a little bit. When you have that proper soil structure, 
you can completely change how you irrigate, how much water it takes to irrigate a crop. Because when we run our sprinkler now, we can put on a lot less water than we used to have to. Because now that we have that structure out there, we have those pore spaces out there, the water infiltrates and goes to the root zone so much faster now. And it's just due to the pore space out there. So our infiltration rate is increased and our water holding capacity is also increased. So we're able to use so much less water to grow the exact same crop that we were using before. So I think once again, it just emphasizes the inefficiencies that come along with poor, unhealthy soils. And then the carbon just plays right into this once again. The heavy or higher organic matter has the same benefits that you're getting from the soil structure. So now the other thing we've really noticed is now that we have this biology thriving in our soil, we've started to control so many pathogens in our soil. Um, the two big ones up here that really affected us was Rhizoctonia. I don't know if you guys have ever seen potatoes that had actually black scurf on them. That's caused by a fungi in the soil. Once we started taking over the soil, that completely cleared up for us. Um, we were also, just before we started making this transition, we were starting to have some trouble with powdery scab. We've completely cleared that one up too. And we didn't go out there and apply anything to c kill off those diseases. But what's going on is we have so much beneficial biology thriving in the soil now that these, the beneficial biology overwhelms the root system for you, creates this healthy system, and what happens is the pathogens don't stand a chance anymore. When you have a root out there, you only have so many areas where bacteria or fungi can colonize on that root. So when you have a sterile system out there, you've opened the door wide open for pathogens to come in and attack that living plant. But when you have the beneficial biology out there that's working hand in hand, back and forth with that living root, you just don't have those opportunities for the, the pathogens to attack. Another big thing we've noticed is fertility. Um, Dick talked about this one a little bit earlier too. We've greatly cut back our inputs. When you look at the amount of N we were applying with inorganic fertilizers to the amount of N we're applying now through these carbon-based fertilizers, we've made drastic cuts. Does that mean the crop we're growing now actually needs less nitrogen? No. What that means is when we had this unhealthy system, these inorganic fertilizers, <clears throat> it was such an inefficient system, we were actually having to overdo it. We were putting more fertility out there than we actually needed because that plant wasn't in a proper environment to receive that, that nutrient. And then also with that, with the inorganic fertilizers, you're so susceptible to leaching and volatilization. It's such an inefficient system. There's losses all along the way. Now when you have these carbon-based fertilizers, what's so nice about them is if you put an excess out there of what you need this growing season, you don't lose it. It actually carries over to the following seasons. And what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see an accumulative effect of that. We've invested in our soil. We're starting to bank this nutrient. So a lot of the products we're applying now it's for the future. It's not necessarily this upcoming crop. We're just feeding the system as a whole. And by doing that, we've been able to greatly increase our efficiency overall. Um, just like everybody else in the San Luis Valley, we were starting to have some nematode population problems. Our populations were rising every year, and we didn't know what to do about it. Once we started applying the compost and taking care of the green manure crops, the nematode populations magically started to decline, even though everybody out there told you the only way to do it was to apply these nematicides. You had to go out and kill them. That was the only approach. But without ever putting a single drop of nematicide on our field, we now have nematode populations that are under control. We don't have any one pathogenic nematode out there that is overwhelming the system. We don't have any nematode damage at all in every season. The other thing that's really nice is we're the, probably the only seed grower in the valley that doesn't spray for aphid. The reason that's such a big issue for seed growers specifically is there are viruses that thrive in potatoes and they can be vectored through aphid. So what happens if an aphid lands on your plant and feeds off of a plant that's been infected, it'll fly to a plant that hasn't been infected yet and when it goes to feed off of it, all of a sudden it, it's been exposed to that virus as well. So seed growers in the San Luis Valley are especially notorious for spraying insecticide like crazy. They're out there just constantly trying to kill these guys off and keep them in check. But like I said, we've been able to not spray insecticide. 
but it's not like we're seeing, we're not being overrun by these viruses either. So that tells me that our aphid populations are in check. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier too, we actually feel like I need a certain population of aphid out in the system as a whole to keep the predatory populations thriving. And that creates a system that actually keeps everything in check. There have been certain seasons where we knew that there was a higher flush of aphid coming into the valley. So what you see is you see the planes going more, you guys got guys are getting really frantic out there trying to kill, 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 trying to keep up with the populations. What's nice for us is we have such a huge population of predatory insects out there that they keep them in check. And what's nice is when your aphid population increase, guess what? You have a greater food source now. So all of a sudden your predatory populations increase right along with it. And you just and, and as the aphid populations go down, <clears throat> the predatory populations kind of come back down with it, but they kind of kind of ebb and flow together with each other. So we've created the system where it keeps everything in check. And then when you start talking about predatory insects in the valley, everybody thinks about ladybugs. You know, that's the most common one we see there, especially for feeding off of aphid. But there are so many others out there that we don't give enough credit to. Um, the parasitic wasp we, we see all over the valley. There's a one on there. But did you know that there's actually fungi that can live on a plant that will actually control insects for you? I was kind of surprised by that. Here, if you, if you ever do a search online for just common insect pathogenic fungi, they'll give you a list of these common ones here. And I know for a fact that three of these have been um, isolated in the San Luis Valley. But once again, you have this problem where, you know, there's some fungal issues with plant foliage in the valley, so these guys are out there trying to kill off the, the pathogens out there. What you're doing is you're killing off these good guys too. So you get never give these guys a chance to control the insects for you. And here's just a picture of what it looks like when, they, when these, this fungi is actually killing off the insects for you. They're actually able to colonize and kill these, these insects for you. And once again, it's just keeping everything in balance. So now that we have proper irrigation, we have nice soil structure, we have nice fertility, we've noticed a huge change in our weed populations out on our farm. You're still gonna have some weeds out there, but one thing we've really noticed is just which weeds are growing out there. Um, weeds are a great indicator of the problems that are going on in your soil. Um, especially in San Luis Valley, if you see a field with a lot of sunflowers in it, it's a sign of a field that's waterlogged. It's got it, the very little pore space in it, poor soil structure, over irrigated. We don't see sunflowers anymore at all. The weeds we do have out there are pigweed and land squirrel. And if you ever do a search for those two online, you know, as far as the indicator plants, those are two indicators of a healthy, fertile soil. And I've actually changed my perception a lot on weeds as we've gone through the years. When you look at these potato fields in the valley, everybody's going out there and just trying to control every last weed. I think, I almost think a guy would be better off with a little bit of weed pressure out there. Because these, they actually, weeds are solving problems for us. You know, they're, they're, a lot of people talk about them being the guardian of the soil. There's a reason certain weeds thrive in certain situations. That's why they're such a good indicator of the problems out there. So you can look at the weeds out there and they should be able to tell you what problem they're trying to solve. So when you take the two scenarios and look at them side by side, <clears throat> There's a few things that really stand out to me. When I look at the slide on the left, it's, it's all about negative. You're always trying to remove something from the system. It's all about killing your problems. Then when you look at the slide on the right, the approach we've taken is it's very positive. We're always adding life to the soil. By all these carbon-based fertilizers, they are very diverse. We're always trying to add a living component to the soil. <clears throat> and I, I like to tell people, it's easier to control problems in your soil with biology than with chemistry. That doesn't mean there's no chemistry going on in our soil. But let the biology dictate it. There's a lot of chemical reactions going on in there. But what we need to do is just everything we do is to add to the system. So I think it's funny when a lot of people in the valley used to ask me, I think they're kind of figuring this out now, but they used to ask, well, what's your, what's your, fun, what's your fungicide program? I said, Heck no, I said, I'm not, I don't want to kill anything in the soil. I actually promote fungal growth in our soil. And they look at you like you're crazy because it's such a bizarre concept. You know, it's kind of backwards thing. It's kind of like, you know, you got pancakes in there? I get a lot of that from <laughs> um, 
We already had a really strong system going on with everything we were doing. Um, the last couple of years, really starting to understand the value of diversity. A lot of this has come from Mike. He, he worked up with the boys up in Burley County. These guys are doing some great things up there. Um, that's another thing to keep in mind is here I am, a potato farmer from the valley. Uh, I learned a lot of stuff from no-till corn and wheat guys in the Midwest. A lot of these concepts are universal, but that's the thing they started telling me and they started telling me I needed a no-till potatoes. Ah, no, that's not going to work, guys. So, I mean, there's a lot of information there that translates across, but you need to be able to take these concepts and apply them to your own situation. So when we first started off with a green manure crop, here's what we were doing. We were on a two-year rotation. So every line here different, um, is, a, is a different crop that we were growing. We were doing a two-year rotation. So Half our acreage each year would be potatoes, the other half would be Sudan grass. So we had a monoculture each year. We were seeing a lot of benefit from doing the Sudan grass. Green manure was working great for us. But we started to realize that that's still, out of 10 years, we're only still growing two crops. You know, they were talking about Gabe Brown and his 99-year rotation. So what, when you start talking about diversity to guys, they think, well, in order to bring diversity into your rotation, that means growing different crops one after each other. And I agree that would do a great job of adding diversity, but look at that. Out of 10 years, I would only grow one potato crop. I'm a potato grower. I'd have some upset seed guys here if I was only producing every 10 years. <laughs> so what, what's really neat about the cocktail mixes, though, is you can take these 10 years and you can condense it into two by planting those different species all at the same time. This is going to be my cocktail mix this year. Um, last year I did a seven-way mix. This year I'm going to go to ten. Seven just wasn't quite enough. <laughs> um, so th that's the seeding rate. That's how many pounds of each of those we're going to plant per acre. It comes out to 41 pounds per acre, I think. Um, so back to that one slide Mike's talking about. You know, there's the four main categories out there. You've got your cool season grass, uh, cool season broadleaf, warm season grass, warm season broadleaf. As you start going through this list, you'll see I've got each of those categories covered. Some of those categories I've got more than one. Um, I do only have the two legumes in there, looking at finding another legume to add in there. So I do come really close to the parameters that he set out there. I've got a 10 way mix with two legumes out there. Now here's a picture of our green manure crop from last year. I don't know, can you guys see that okay? Um, there's a repass in that jar around. Oh. Uh, Mike's sending a seed sample around right here. That is my seven-way mix from last year. You guys were asking about how to plant it. Mix it together and just go plant it. It's pretty simple, really. And that's why I like the story he's talking about the guys in North Dakota. You know, that first year they planted that mix on accident. They got done at the end of the day. They had all these bags out there. They just cleaned them out and just tossed them out there and just thought, oh, just, it'll fill the spot out there. They had no idea what they were about to embark on out there. But we've seen great benefits from having these mixtures out there all at the same time. And what, what I like to see on this right side is you see all the different root systems out there. What's nice about having these mixes is these root systems are all occupying different zones in that soil. When you have a monoculture, each of those green manure crops can do great things on their own, but there's only a certain segment they can do. But what happens, you get them all out there working together and they're all doing their own role. You've got the legumes out there which are adding nitrogen. We've got buckwheat out there which is, has an acidic root so it's great at freeing up tight up phosphorus in the soil. Uh, you got the Sudan grass with the deep root system. We've got radishes and turnips in there which are great at going in the soil and breaking up hard compaction. So they all play their own role. And I know you won't be able to see it on this but the plant all the way on, the, on the, my right there is actually a red root pigweed. You guys were asking about weeds out there. I did have some red root pigweed out there. I could care less. If, if, if you could see that picture a little better, have you seen the root system on a red root pigweed? It's got an amazing root system to it. It's still adding diversity to that system. I think it's doing me a lot of good having it out there. So that's why when I dug these up, I didn't throw the pigweed aside. I just kept it in the picture. Because I planted a seven-way mix, but I actually grew an eight-way mix. There's nothing wrong with having that weed out there as long as you're managing it properly. Now see, when we're going out there and working in our residue, we actually chop the residue and incorporate it. So what's nice about that is once that red root pigweed was getting close to producing viable seed, that's when we terminated the crop. So we weren't producing more seed. So when you manage that weed correctly, it's no longer a weed. 
So that's why I say, if weeds get such a bad name, they don't deserve it. They're actually trying to help us out. So instead of calling it red root pigweed, I'd prefer people just call it red root pig plant. I think they'd have a completely <laughs> different perception on it. How about the amaranth? Yeah, amaranthus retroflexus. We'll call it whatever you want, but quit calling it a weed. Because I think it's actually doing you benefit in that scenario. Now see, you remember how Mike was talking earlier? Uh, the question was, he was asked about how I terminate the crop. Mike was talking earlier about what's the difference between residue and trash. In the potato world, that residue becomes trash. So I want that residue to break down very quickly. There's other scenarios where you want to leave that residue on top, where you grow more of a grain crop wherever. But I want that residue to break down very quickly because by the time I'm planting potatoes, I want that residue to be gone because that residue can actually cause problems for the planting and the harvesting process. So what we go through, we go through with a flail beater and we just chop it up really fine. Then we go through with a, a sunflower mulcher and we incorporate the residue, but we, we try to keep that residue in the top six inches of the soil. That's where the biology thrives that's going to be able to break down that, that residue for us. And we want that residue to be gone by the time we're planting potatoes the next spring. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're tilling about 12 inches deep, but we're trying to incorporate that residue in the top six inches. So it's a shallow incorporation of the residue. The next year. Yeah. Uh, they're about six inches. Yeah. yeah, it's all mechanized. So the point I was trying to make here about bringing in this diversity is you remember the, the chart earlier where I had the single lines going in there. In each of these components we have our green manure, they all have their beneficial aspects. But what's nice about when you start bringing these diverse crops in there, when you have that diverse green manure, you have the diverse <coughs> carbon-based fertilizers, is they all have multiple beneficial effects to the system as a whole. Have you guys, are you guys familiar with the three sisters? I don't have to explain this much then. But just, <laughs> it's companion crop. Growing beans, corn, and squash all together. Now why in the world would you do that? Each plant you're planting out there has its specific role. This really goes hand in hand with what I was talking about with these cocktail mixes. You know, you have the corn and up, growing up high, which has a support for the bean to climb up. You've got the squash for your ground cover. They all serve a purpose. And by mixing those three crops together, they all thrive more than if you were to plant them individually because they're all complementing each other and solving problems for each other. So the next big step on Rocky Farms is we're going to try doing this ourselves to a certain degree. And I don't know, can you guys see there? We, what we got is a potato crop here, but you see these other funny looking vines poking up in there? Yes. What, what I did this last year is I planted peas with my potatoes. What do I have to gain from that? I've got a diverse root system in my soil now, growing side by side the potatoes. I'm getting away from a monoculture. A pea is a legume, it's adding nitrogen to my soil. The thing I like about the pea is it climbs right up the potato plant, it's not competing with the potato plant, so they're actually complementing each other very well. So we're in the process right now of getting a potato planter built because I was so impressed by the trials we ran out here. I'm going to plant the whole farm this way next year where I'm going to be incorporating legumes with our potato crop. I really think one of the biggest challenges we have as a whole in conventional agriculture is monocultures. When you start looking at nature, monocultures do not exist. That is a man-made event. And we're, monocultures create so many more problems for us. So we really need to find ways of incorporating different crops together at the same time. Crops that are complementing each other and crops that are going to help each other out. So now when you go back to our rotation, this will be our rotation. I'm looking at, I'm going to try out some chicken and veg too with the peas this year. So my potato crop, I'm going to have potato, peas, and chicken and veg. I'm going to rotate it with a 10-way mix. And chances are, you know I've got this on a 10-year basis. Ch chances are my mix will change a little bit each year just based off what's available or not. But look at all these different crops I'm growing out here just to produce a potato crop. I, I think I'm very excited about the potential we have of controlling even more problems out there just by getting this diversity out there, getting all these living roots out there. 
So when you go back, compare that slide to this one again, look at where we were, look how far we've kind of come as far as introducing diversity into the system. <clears throat> one thing I think is really interesting is when you start talking back in the valley to some guys, is they want to know how you can afford to grow a green manure crop at all. Because the main rotation in the, in the San Luis Valley is potato and barley. You've got cash crop after cash crop. But I've got major issues with having that barley crop out there following that potato crop. You've got a lot of residue left over, and you're incorporating that residue. It's overwhelming the system with carbon. It created a lot of disease issues for us, a lot of immobility with fertility and everything. So we saw a lot of benefit to doing the green manure crop. Another big reason we brought in the green manure crop initially was for the water savings. When you're growing a barley crop, you're using about 20 to 25 inches to grow that barley crop, whereas you can use eh, five to seven inches to grow this green manure crop. So you're not growing it to full maturity, it's a lot shorter system. And then what you're doing is you're bringing that back and incorporating it to the soil, and you're actually benefiting that potato crop next year. So when we first switched to this rotation here, our concern was now we only have one cash crop every other year. Can we afford to do this? And that was one of my brother's big issues too. But what we started to see as we went along is we're actually making more money now than we were when we were growing that potato grain rotation. Because now we're investing in that soil. And it's to the point now where we've reduced our input so drastically that it's actually on the potato crop that it's offset any income we might have made off that barley crop. And I've told a lot of people this, and they didn't believe me. So last year, my presentation, I, I did an economic analysis. So now we're going to switch to the green side. Because I mean, money is a big issue in this. So that's why instead, of, we all know it makes sense to do this, but it doesn't make sense. Because, I mean, it's great to feed people and whatnot, but I mean, we're making a living at this. We have to make money doing this, otherwise we will not be able to continue. So what I did is I, I sat down with a very open-minded conventional farmer in the San Luis Valley that was doing, I mean, he was right along with everybody else in the valley. We did a two-year economic analysis on the way we were raising a crop versus how he was raising a crop, and we wanted to see how the two measured. So the first thing we did is on that first year, we had my green manure crop versus his barley crop. Big difference there. Because everything in the green manure crop, I wasn't harvesting a crop. I had nothing to sell off of that crop. I was putting it back into the soil. So it was a straight expense. You know, it cost me $12,000 to do a 120 acre circle of my green manure mix. Here he was on the other side growing barley for Coors. There's all of his inputs, but then he went and sold the crop. So, so at 150 bushels on an $11 contract, he sold the crop for $95,000. He cost him six, almost $70,000 to grow the crop, so he actually made $26,000 off that crop. So year one, that's the trouble. Everybody always wants to look at it on a year-by-year -year basis. When you compare those numbers there, yeah, I'd say he's winning. He's, he's well ahead of me. But what we need to do is look at what impact does this have further down the road. So once again, these are my actual numbers. Those were my cost of production on this 120 acres. Those were his, his numbers. This is based off of a 120 acre circle. Now keep in mind, my system on the left, this is an established system. It took us quite a while to get here. We've earned the right to farm this way now. But these are very real numbers, and I don't ever see these numbers increasing based off of our inputs. So you see I'm starting to make up a little bit, bit of ground now on I can grow a crop on so much less fertility now because I've got a much more efficient system out there. I have very little waste out there as far as fertility goes. My favorite slide. These are actual numbers. And I'll tell you, he's, he's one of the lighter appliers of chemicals in the valley too. I know guys that are applying nematicide up to, what would you say Dick, there's guys putting on four to $6,000 worth of nematicide on a circle of potatoes, easy. So all of a sudden, start, things start looking a little different here. And the only reason my numbers are zero on the left here is because of how we're farming by feeding the life of the soil, creating this biology out there, which is allowing us not to have to go out there and attack these pest problems. So keep in mind, you have to, you have to earn the right to get to this level. But I am at this level. These are actual numbers. We did not apply anything with a side on the end of it last year. And we grew a great crop. Water is another issue, and it's a growing issue in the San Luis Valley. Last year's crop was the first crop where we had to pay for our water. Now the water savings on the green manure side, that's easy. You know, you're growing a shorter season crop, you're, you have huge savings there. The thing that amazed me 
is how much less water we started using on the potato crops the following years as a result of growing those green manure crops. We were feeding that light in the soil. We had that structure. It started to show us just how inefficient we were using water before when we didn't have that soil structure out there. So I've been averaging 12.7 inches to grow a potato crop. He's averaging about 20 inches of water. We're in a little, we're growing a little different crop. He's growing about seven to 10 days longer than me. He's growing rust, it's getting a little bigger. We're growing fingerling seed. We try to keep it a little smaller. So I went ahead and bumped that number up a little bit. I figured I had to grow just a little bit longer. So trying to make it as fair of a comparison as possible. But you can see based off of the amount we have to pay for our water now, there's another huge savings for us by that water savings. So now when you look at it on a two year basis, this is how the numbers compare. So you know you have on the green on my side of the green manure crop, I have that listed as an expense because it costs me to grow that crop. On the barley side, I've got that as a negative number because it offset the, the, the expenses on his potato crop. But as you can see, they came out pretty darn close. But keep in mind, the only way that his numbers ended up that close on his side is he produced a barley crop at 150 bushels, had high enough quality to get accepted into Coors. So when you start doing a risk comparison on it, it starts looking even more favorable for my side too. Because just like everywhere else, we have a barley crop out there, and of course, when, when is our season when we get the most hail? Right when that barley crop's ready to harvest. There was one year we had a green manure crop, everybody else had the barley out there, we got a huge hailstorm that came through. The barley guys were devastated because their barley was all laying on the ground. It didn't bother me because my green manure, we were getting ready out to go out there and chop it anyways. So just the risk that's involved there is a lot better for us. And once again, we're investing in our soil by doing that green manure crop and it's paying off down the road. So I think that's the thing is you just really have to look at this thing in a multiple year deal instead of just taking that one year. Once again, it just goes with that, that tunnel vision that tends to come along with conventional agriculture. Uh, he's actually, he's growing, he's raising two circles, I'm raising four. That's why we just did it on a circle by circle basis. If they were both 120 acres versus 120 acres. What's, what's the net income over the two years? That wasn't, a, I didn't even want to go into that necessarily because we're growing two different potato crops. They were both potatoes, so I felt like what it took to grow the crop was very comparable. We're doing certified seed. We got specialties and some different things going on there. It's not a fair comparison, so I didn't even want to go there on this analysis. But um, I guess that brings up a good point that we have seen a huge increase in our quality of our crop too, as the years have gone on, as we've started taking care of the soil. Like I said, we got rid of the rhizoctonia. We don't have the black script on the tubers anymore. We don't have the nematodes causing problems on the tubers. We don't have the powdery scab. When we run a seed order now, we hardly throw anything away. The sort out is so minimal. So I guarantee you the net return would be increased as well. Brendan, did you compare fuel cost for going through the field? No, because we really didn't have good records on that. But I know that's another thing to favor my side of it. God, I don't. I think part of the problem is John Deere's making their calves too nice now. People must like spending time in those tractors. Because I see a lot of guys out there doing who knows what for, I don't know, I can't figure out why. We, we haven't done our fall field work yet. What used to be known as fall field work, because after a potato crop, there's field work you used to do. We haven't touched our ground yet. Because we've just started looking at things so much differently. We don't like to go out in that tractor unless we are serving a specific purpose. So now we're going to have, we're actually going to plant our green manure mix straight into our potato ground without doing any tillage at all. So we're going to be down to one deep tillage every other year. So when you talk about um, growing your carbon in the soil, I think that's going to have huge impacts there too. So uh, we go and buy used tractors. We don't even buy new one. There's no point. We don't spend much time on it. How long did it take you to develop this system to where you're at the point you are now? Keep in mind, when we did this, it was 20 years ago when we made the transition. We had no help. What we've learned, if we could go back with the knowledge we have now, um, somebody mentioned the three years. I think three years is a really good number if you're doing things properly to really see the system take a one in. Now we've been doing this for 20 years and I still don't feel like we've plateaued. We're still seeing improvement every single year and that's what's so exciting. 
I don't know when we're ever going to reach that peak. I don't know if we ever will. It's every time we get satisfied with something, you know, we haven't talked on this, and it's just like, okay, we're happy with that. Let's find out what's next. You know, Gary Zimmer always talks about what's your limiting factor. I was talking to him three years ago, you know, we were doing just potato and sedan. He said, what's your limiting factor? I said, I don't know, I think we're doing pretty good, aren't we? He said, yeah, you're doing great, but there's always a limiting factor. There's always something to improve on. So, I, I, but like I said, if the guy was serious about it, committed to it, I think in three years he could see dramatic changes. It does look like you're going organic every time it gets uh... Yeah, that's a great point. We, we are not certified organic. Um, the one thing we do use that keeps us from being organic is we do use a bind desiccant to kill off our potatoes. With everything we're raising, um, size is so critical. We're growing fingerling potatoes. They have a premium market for them. You don't want them to get too big. With seed, the same thing. You don't want them to get too big. We really like going out and killing our crop at the time we need to. So we use sulfuric acid as a bind desiccant. That can keep us from being more certified organic. But the thing is, too, I don't know if we'll, even if even if there was a certified organic bind desiccant on the market that was available, I don't know if we would ever go certified organic. Or not. I think it would actually put limitations on our production because the way we farm, it looks like we're very organic, minded, but just we're taking care of the soil. But yet, I, I feel like these the fungicides, the pesticides, they have their place, and there are certain times where they can serve a purpose. I just don't like relying on. And as you take care of the soil more and more, there's less you need to rely on. I'll give you a perfect example. There was, a, it was probably about two or three years ago, somebody brought some seed in that had late blight on it. This is a fungal problem and caused huge issues in the San Luis Valley. It tends not to thrive in the valley, but if the weather conditions are just right, we, we've had it twice in the history of the valley. <coughs> Let's say we knew there was um, positive inoculation of early, a late blight in the valley. I knew it was coming up when I would use a fungicide to get me through that season because that's that's a devastating issue there. But it's not something I'm going to be doing every single year. So I like having those tools at my disposal. If that makes sense. I was curious if anybody, if you, you had done a study of nutrient difference in a potato or is grown the way you do it. Uh, yes, we're, we're involved with CSU right now. Um, they came in and pulled tuber samples off of our farm versus some conventional farms and versus an organic farm, and they wanted to see the nutrient density difference in those. Haven't seen any results yet. Oh. CSU for you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when we'll see results, but yes, they're working on that. Um, so they do have results. I, 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 I'll, I'd stand behind that 100%. I do have some results on potato stuff from the UK, but yeah, I mean, yeah, they're showing there can be a huge difference in the nutrient quality of the crop based off the soil that's grown. And I, I absolutely would agree with that. Yeah, so. it's a better food. Yeah, and I and um, <coughs> we've got a lot of people that stop by our place for potatoes, and we've got a lot of people that when we run out of potatoes, they stop eating potatoes until we harvest them. We've got a lot of people hooked on our potatoes. There is a flavor difference in our potatoes. Absolutely. So, I was going to show one last slide here. I come to you today not with all the answers, but I, I just want to challenge you. I want to introduce these concepts to you. But if I can ask you guys to do anything, challenge yourself a little bit. Try to meet these three criteria, and I think you'll start seeing great results. But quit trying to kill off any living component of of the system as a whole. Start adding life to the soil, and once you get to that point, start diversifying that life as much as you can. And I think you'll start seeing some great results. And the other thing I want to keep, have you keep in mind is Mike kept throwing all these great quotes out there about, oh, the 1930s, you know, and George Washington 200 years ago, I beat you. Because yeah. <laughs> Cleopatra made it illegal in Egypt to kill an earthworm. So this was over 2,000 years ago, that we knew life, the importance of life in the soil, but here we are today treating it as if it's a brand new concept. We knew this all along. It's just somewhere along the lines we got away from these ideas. It's time to get back to them. I don't know, I'm considering. <laughs>